Warning, the Savage Nation contains adult language, adult content, psychological nudity. Listener discretion is advised. And now, America's most exciting radio talk show, The Savage Nation, home of unprotected talk, borders, language, culture, and here he is, Michael Savage. Blue Monday, how I hate Blue Monday. Got to work, like a slave on me. Do you have Blue Monday or you can't find it? He'll come Tuesday, oh, Tuesday. I'm so tired, got no time to play. Let's stop the opening. I see that socialism is on the rise here in America, which is amazing to me, given that Bernie Sanders is a classic uh, 1930s New York Lower East Side communist on a soapbox. And yet he seems to be stirring up a little uh, attention here and there. I mean, he got 400 people in Nebraska, and they said he's getting great crowds. If I gave a speech, I'd get 30,000 people, and the New York Times would ignore the crowds the same way they're ignoring my novel. But forget about me for a minute. I want to talk about socialism. Many of you think you're a socialist or you want to be socialist because you think it's fair. And so we're going to have a little discussion today on the Savage Nation on what is socialism? Where has it actually worked? What has actually happened when socialism was enacted in a country? I'll give you the best example I know of. You can go 70 miles south of Miami. You'll see socialism in action. 40 years of a prison camp run by the Castro a gangster regime. The people live like slaves. The two brothers and their cronies live like kings. There's socialism. And yet you see the kids coming out of the colleges with their brains washed, believing in socialism. They don't even know what it means. But they think it's a good thing where everybody will be equal and everybody will be fair. Now, we've had six or seven years of the phony in the White House pushing this lie while living... I would say, a richer life than any president in American history. Classic socialism, by the way, which is feed the people the garbage they want to hear and then live high on the hog. So you have to ask yourself, why is socialism suddenly on the rise in America? Why are people interested in this? Left-wing politicians are in retreat across the entire Western world, except in the United States. Did you know that? They are in retreat in France, Germany, Italy, England, they've gotten defeated in all of these nations. The left-wingers have been thrown out of office in most of the Western world. But in the United States, there seems to be an infatuation with socialism, as exemplified by this Lower East Side street agitator, Bernie Sanders, who seems to be running at 15% in the Democratic polls. He's rioting higher than any U.S. socialist since Eugene Debs ran for the White House 100 years ago. Now, it's unlikely he'll unseat Hillary Clinton. She's got too much money. But he is dragging her to the left. There is another left winger on the rise, Martin O'Malley, who I call the American Putin. I call Martin O'Malley the American Putin for a number of reasons, and I don't have to go into the details. Let's listen to Martin O'Malley in clip two. We need to prosecute cheats. We need to reinstate Glass-Steagall. And if a bank is too big to fail without wrecking our nation's economy, then we need to break it up before it breaks us again. Well, I never heard O'Malley till I listened to the sound clips. His voice is too, uh, too tinny to attract any attention. But nevertheless, he says, let's reinstate Glass-Steagall. I actually agree with that. It's one of the principles in my book, Trickle Up Poverty, from a couple of years ago. And many of you don't know what Glass-Steagall is. This act, instituted in 1933, required the separation of commercial and investment banks. It's very simple. It required commercial and investment banks to be separated. It was repealed in 1999 by Bill Clinton's Treasury Secretary. I think his name was Rubin. And it was one of the key factors leading to the breakdown of the residential mortgage investment sector. I totally agree it needs to be reinstated. We also need to reinstate the Wall Street uptick rule because we have out-of-control speculation right now that is unhealthy and very dangerous and should lead to another collapse. But let's not get too specific. Let's listen to Bernie Sanders in clip 32 and you listen to the demagogue himself. When people are prepared to fight back, there is nothing that cannot 
be accomplished. We can live in a country where every person has health care yeah, yeah, is yeah. a right, yeah, not a privilege. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We yeah, can yeah. live in a country where every person, no matter no matter their race, yeah, their yeah, religion, yeah, yeah. their right, disability, right. or their sexual right, orientation, right. realizes the full promise of equality that yeah, is yeah. our birthright as Americans. That yeah, is the nation. You stink we like can a rotten corned beef sandwich. Shut together. him up. He smells like an old corned beef sandwich fell out of a truck off Katz's back truck. Are you kidding me? Let me tell you something, old Bernie, and you know it better than anybody. We've heard this equality crap before, and I'll tell you the truth, Bernie. I wrote a little line about 30 years ago when I was shafted by affirmative action. You know what it was, what it was entitled, Bernie? I wrote one simple line. Without quality, we cannot have equality. Don't fool yourself. Not everybody is equal. Oh, we may be born equal, but are we? Are we really born equal? Are you telling me I could be a linebacker? Can you tell me the average linebacker can be a talk show host? Of course not, Bernie. We're snowflakes, Bernie. But socialism would like us all turned into slush. How's that for a line? So let's get past the, and the opening of uh, why is socialism popular in America now. I will invite you to call me at 855-407-282 and talk about this. Why is socialism suddenly gaining traction in America right now? Not only have America's moral views moved to the left over the last number of years, but America's political views are moving to the left over the last couple of years. And you have to go back to reality to understand that socialism has never worked. Wherever it has been tried, it has never worked. Again, I point to Cuba. Look to the ex-Soviet Union. Ask your Russian neighbor how life was like in the United Socialist States, uh, United Soviet uh, Republic, USSR. How did that work out for all of the socialists in all of the republics that were under the banner of those in the Kremlin? Well, they lived very poorly while those in government lived very richly, very much like today. Government uh, agents live very, very well in this country and abuse the taxpayer as often as they could because a fish rots from the head down. As you all know, Obama has rotted the fish uh, from the head down. But what is socialism? What actually is socialism is the question. Well, socialism means that the government takes over the direct control and management of the industries and social services by the workers. What does that mean? Are you telling me that the government is going to take over farming? Would the government taking over farms produce more and better crops? Because I'm starting with something obvious. You know and I know that that was tried in the Soviet Union in the 1930s, where they started to debase the uh, Soviet farmers, the Russian farmers. They called them kulaks, very much like Obama has started to come up with a phrase called white privilege in order to attack white people. The universities have been putting out this racist garbage for a few years now. And so they started by uh, demonizing the farmers in the Soviet Union, calling them kulaks, meaning profiteers in essence. And what happened soon thereafter was the people started to say, yeah, yeah, those damn farmers, they're making too much money. Now, remember, so the Soviet Union was the breadbasket of the entire region for, for a long period of time. They were producing wheat. They were self-sufficient. They were able to feed themselves and export many products, including wheat, around the world. Once the government took over the farms, the government, in its typical fashion of mismanagement, mismanaged the farms. Crop production fell, food production fell, food distribution fell. There was mass starvation and 30 million people died. This is what happens whenever a government takes over a private industry. It cannot do it better. It does it worse. Do you understand this? Do you understand how this works? Now, many of the bums listening to this show don't work for a living, but they hate those of us who do work for a living. They're green with envy. They're green with envy because they think that we stole it from them. They think that they're on the bottom because we took it from them. They think that we on the top took it from them. Where did they get this foolish idea from? From Barack Obama and the media and the universities. The fact of the matter is, there are always winners and losers in every country, in every society, in every tribe, in every village. I've lived in primitive villages. And in the smallest villages that I've lived in, in the Fiji Islands, uh, I've seen those who were chiefs. I've seen those who were princes and princesses in the, in, the, in the familial line. And I've seen those at the very bottom. There's no equality on this earth, whether it be in the animal kingdom or in the human kingdom. 
there never has been and there never will be equality. Does this mean that we should let those in the bottom starve to death? Can you tell me of anyone who is starving to death in America? We have an obesity epidemic amongst the poor in this country because they're stuffing their faces with food around the clock instead of working their stuffing. No, we should take care of the poor. We should take care of the weak. We should take care of the sick. Uh, however, we shouldn't take care of the world's poor, uh, the world's sick, and the world's weak. We can't hardly take care of our own domestic variety of parasite. So let's be clear. When I was a child and I would drive around in my father's car on the way to work, I would look at everything and observe as a smart child does, whatever the race or religion of a child, that a child will observe. And I used to hate working. I hated going to work. I hated, resented it like you can't believe. I didn't like working. I wanted to stay home and play with my friends. My father was an immigrant and he wanted to teach me the work ethic. So he made me go to work on the weekends and we drive in his old cars. Well, they were a couple of years old over the Kosciuszko Bridge from Queens at that time into Manhattan to his store in the Lower East Side on Ludlow Street. And I would observe human life as I went by the tenements, the uh, old apartments in the, in the Williamsburg area, Greenpoint, which are, now you pay a million dollars for a junky apartment. But nevertheless, I would observe and I would say, wouldn't it be nice, I would imagine, if there was no money in the world, this is a child's view now. This is how socialists think. This is how college professors think. Wouldn't it be nice if there was no means of trade called money? And I said, what if the man went to work every day and my father just gave away his merchandise to people and exchanged it, I thought, let's say for food or for gasoline or for a car. And I thought that would be nice. Nobody would have to work too hard. Everybody would just exchange goods. But then I said, wait a minute. What happens, I thought, if some guys don't want to work as hard as the other guy? Well, what if some guys don't want to work at all? And then I realized that I was not a socialist. Unfortunately, Bernie Sanders never, never had that moment. He never realized that there are some people who are lazy or cheats. And as a result of that, he doesn't understand the real world. So that kicks off my discussion of socialism. I'll be right back. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. My Savage Nation is sponsored by SwissAmerica.com. It's the only company I trust to protect my wealth. Call 800-B-U-I-C-O-I-N. Powerful, wealthy special interests here at home have used our government to create in our own country yeah, an economy yeah, yeah. that is leaving a majority of our people behind, yeah, an economy yeah, yeah. that has so concentrated wealth and power in the hands of the very few yeah, yeah. that it has taken opportunity out of the homes of the many. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And who do you hang around with? The, the thugs of uh, Baltimore or the ones who've taken the uh, opportunity out of the homes of many, Mr. O'Malley? Who, who'd you invite to dinner recently? Who came to the O'Malley household recently? Was it the thugs of Baltimore who burned the city to the ground? Or was it the powerful that he hates so much? What a bunch of garbage. All of these politicians are playing the, the demagogue act right now because it's worked for the con man in the White House so well. They figure, you know, I may as well get on in the act. So now they're espousing naked socialism, which has been tried in many, many places. And uh, I don't know where it's worked. Maybe someone can enlighten me. Uh, I've heard so much about socialism my entire life. And here's something I've also noticed amongst the, art the artists and bohemians who are all socialists at heart as they sit around in their fat behinds uh, drinking a glass of wine in a cafe, let's say, in San Francisco somewhere instead of working during the day. They sit and talk about the, uh, they extol the benefits of socialism and what a great nation it would be if it were a socialist nation and how, how they are anti-capitalist. But at the hint of a dollar, at the smell of a buck, at the hint of a contract, at the smell of a grant, they will jump out of that cafe chair so fast that the entire table goes over, knocking over the bottles and glasses themselves. <clears throat> They're not capitalists at all until they smell a dollar. Then get out of their way as fast as you can because you're liable to be trampled. <laughs> That's the truth about socialists and socialism in a nutshell. That's socialism 101 from a man who knows the truth, Michael Savage. So now we have demagogues like this, uh, this uh, whatever his name is, uh, Bernie Sanders, Bernie Sanders. Now all of a sudden O'Malley's coming up, and he's espousing all of this stuff. Well, who is O'Malley? 
I called in the American Putin because he likes to be seen bare-chested like Putin. He's a vigorous speaker, and he's an energetic presidential contender. But what, what has the history actually been? Well, Jennifer Harper of the Washington Times headlined it like this. The $8 billion history of Martin O'Malley. He raised taxes and fees 83 times. O'Malley was committed to raising as many different taxes as high as possible during his eight years as governor, says Grover Norquist. The voters of Deep Blue Maryland gave their verdict on his governorship when they defeated his hand-picked candidate and elected an anti-tax Republican as governor. Not everyone can lose an election when they were not even on the ballot. Did you hear this? So who is he a darling of? The environmentalist gangsters, for example, and union bosses love him. Environmentalist gangsters who are making billions of dollars to create companies that produce very little at taxpayer expense love him. A Gallup poll found last year that 47% of people in Maryland would move out of the state if they could. 47% would leave if they could. A tax foundation study found that the state lost 66,000 residents and $5.5 billion in taxable income between 00 and 010. Maryland ranks the seventh in the nation for the worst taxes according to Wall Street analysis. The Fiscal Times rates Maryland at number 10. So the fact of the matter is, he speaks like a classic New York street socialist radical of the 1930s or 40s, just as does that other one whose name I forget immediately. I can't remember it. Bernie Sanders. I mix him up with uh, the Kentucky Fried Chicken. But at least the Kentucky Fried Chicken guy created something. He created the KFC chain. Bernie Sanders has created nothing but foul breath. So the question is, why is American socialism suddenly popular? And can anyone listening to this show tell me, name one country where socialism has worked and bettered the middle class? I don't know of one. Would it be darling Cuba, where the people live in a prison camp run by the Castro gangster regime? Where is socialism actually working other than in the universities, where these filthy rich professors do nothing but espouse hate for America jo and collect 150 grand a year. 55400savage 8554007282 Climate change is real and it also happens to be the greatest business opportunity to come to our country for a hundred years. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Nancy so Pelosi knows we that. we must create an American right. job. Knock off O'Malley. Please turn it off. Climate change is real, and it happens to be the greatest business opportunity. Well, he's telling you the truth about it being a business opportunity for him and his cronies. Many people have made fortunes on uh, climate change without proving that it's real. And more particularly without, without proving that man is causing the climate change. Now, I'm all for pure air and clean waters and stuff. And I've worked at that for many years, decades, as a matter of fact. But there is no consensus that man is causing climate change. None whatsoever. And also, those of you who are self-righteously driving battery-driven cars, I applaud your desire to drive a clean car. Uh, but behind that clean car, there's some really filthy energy that was used to make that battery that probably you don't know about. Or every time you recharge that clean little battery, where do you think the energy is coming from at the recharging station? Probably a coal-fired plant somewhere or a water-generated uh, plant somewhere, but I guess that's causing you to think too much as you drive around in your, in your, in your snotty little car. But and we're talking about it socialism. It's uh, going through a revival right now. It's a kind of knee-jerk response to to things for the college educated people who live at home and their mothers and can't get jobs and are on medication they don't understand why no one will hire them they're unemployable that's why they're unemployable is because they were steeped in anti-american socialism and they, there's no jobs for them i mean how many government jobs can there be another 75 million government jobs i guess that would take care of their employment needs jerry brown is moving as quickly as he can to create as many state jobs as he can for people to do nothing but stop those of us who do something from doing more for society but why is socialism going through this popularity well let's look at the other side of the ledger on the other side of the ledger we see men like bill gates in microsoft 
not paying his fair share of taxes, in my opinion. On the other side of the ledger, we see men like Warren Buffet not at all paying his fair share of taxes while telling you to pay your fair share of taxes. Now, Warren Buffet has always said we're not paying enough taxes while he himself derives dividend income and pays 15% on it. You probably pay 39% in federal tax on your income. Warren Buffet, a good friend of Obama, is also in favor of blocking the Keystone XL pipeline, which is why his stooge in the White House, the golfer, has continuously blocked the Keystone XL pipeline. The reason the stooge in the White House has blocked the Keystone XL pipeline is because guys like Warren Buffet uh, transport the oil, the raw oil from the Alberta tar sands to our refineries on his railroad cars. And to transport the oil for refining to our refineries by pipeline would be much cheaper than by Warren Buffet's railroad cars. And it would put his uh, enterprise, his railroad enterprise, in jeopardy. As a result, he's against the XL pipeline. And so the stooge in the White House vetoed the Keystone XL pipeline, even though the unions wanted the Keystone XL pipeline because it would have created many, many jobs for union members. So you look at the other side of the ledger and you see these greedy pigs disguised as very nice men getting away with virtual murder, not paying their fair share. You look at corporate structures, and most people who work for corporations are you and I. They're your neighbor. They're you. And you're paying your fair share of taxes. You have to. It's taken out of your paycheck. And yet there are people who are living at the corporate level who are not paying their fair share of taxes, getting around the tax law. Look at what came out about Google in Europe. Google paid something like a few hundred million dollars on many, many billions of dollars of income because of the tricks they're using in their tax structures in Europe. Well, I hope to God the European Union takes them to the cleaners and takes from the Google boys what they deserve, which is a fair taxation. So yes, there are problems with the, some of the very, very powerful and mainly those connected to the political structure getting away with paying very little in taxes, and we see it. So that fuels this desire for equality, this desire to get even. But you better be very careful what you wish for, as they say, because socialism has never worked anywhere on earth. Nowhere on earth has it ever worked. Phone number is 855-407-282. Now, it could work in a society where all people were working equally, for example. It could never work in America where we have so many people who don't work and never will work and have no skills to work and don't want to work. It will never work in a country like ours for many other reasons. Maybe it's worked in a small country here and there where the people are all of the same background and are all willing to pull the, pull the wagon. WABC, John, you're the first up. Go ahead, please. What's your comment on socialism? Well, sin causes socialism, and separation from God causes so socialism. Uh, yeah, but I want to limit this to, a, to an economics discussion. I don't want to get into, into morality. Well, no, but it, it, it's all tied together. Oh, you mean everyone who's a capitalist is good, is pure, morally pure? No, but it it it. I mean, all socialists are morally impure. Come on, that argument makes no sense. No, 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 no. But it's all right. Thanks for the call. We're not ready for that one. What people don't know is that America is probably sixty percent socialist right now. You don't even understand that. We're talking about should we have socialism? Should we not have socialism? Ever since Bill Clinton seized power, the country has become increasingly socialist. What do you think welfare is? What do you think high taxation is? What do you think, quote, graduated income tax is? What do you think about free health care for all is? Socialism. That's what it means. Now, you can say anything that's for sale or profit is evil. That's utter nonsense. You mean the government should produce the, the, the uh, goods? You want the government to control and manage food production in this country? Are you sure? <laughs> Tell me about it the next time you analyze or compare the United States Postal Service to Federal Express, and you'll understand the difference between socialism and capitalism right then and there. WMAL, Kevin, welcome to the Savage Nation. Hey, Dr. Savage, how you doing? First of all, I just wanted to say... Um I'm a millennial myself, and uh, something you said the other day really touched me, how 
we might not always speak out, but there's a lot of people like me out there, and we're just waiting, lying in wait, because we know what happened. Obama is a self-proclaimed socialist, and we know what he's doing to this country, removing the private means of production from the citizens and making it, as you said, run by the government. The government can't run anything, right? The government cannot run anything except cutting checks and printing money. <sighs> Taking it right out of my pocket. That's right. Now, what do socialists really want? They want the government to control all industries and run all industries. That's what they mean. And they want, let's say, steel to be made by the government. I don't know how much steel is made in this country anymore. They want cars to be made by the government. How'd that work out? Uh, I The last I checked, the Soviets didn't produce a very good char, uh, car. I, I believe that uh, that that wouldn't work out. How about clothing? How did the production of clothing by the communist Chinese work out? Well, everyone had the same blue suit with a red star. How's that for fashion? I suppose that uh, Bernie Sanders would like that. In fact, I would wish he would campaign in a little blue suit, a Mao jacket, and a and a red star. It'd be it'd be more fitting than the than the suit that he's wearing from Robert Hall that he inherited from a stiff somewhere uh, in a mortuary. Uh, what about owning pr personal possessions? Do you know what happens under socialism? Did you know what happened in communist China when the communists took over China way back when? See, right now, China is not really a communist nation. Com China has more ca free capitalism right now than we do, combined with a fascist dictatorship running it, which is where we're going right now. But as far as an economic system goes, the Chinese enjoy more freedoms than we do. There are less taxes. There are lower regulations. And there's more freedom to produce goods and distribute goods and sell goods in China without government interference than we have in this country right now. That's something for you to know. Uh, way back in the old days, I think I wrote about it in one of my books. Yeah, I remember. It was about the food dolls. You know those, uh, I don't know how to describe them to you, those gargoyles that you sometimes see in Chinatown, those weird faces. Well, you know that they look like lions and stuff like that. They were put to scare away, uh, they were put in front of houses to scare away evil spirits, so to speak. And I remember telling the story on this show about my buying some wooden 16th century food dolls about six months ago from an antique store in San Francisco. And I, I researched a little bit on that. After the communist revolution occurred in China, the Khmer Rouge of China, the Red Brigades, went around in China confiscating all of the, these artworks as exemplifications of bourgeoisie behavior, and they destroyed them. So they had to break them off temple tops, rooftops. Now, many people hid them when they knew that these maniac children were coming around to take away these, uh, these gargoyles, which are part of the communi uh, uh, Chinese uh, heritage. Uh, the point I'm making is that communism is a is a system that evolves from socialism. And as you well know, both lead to fascism, which is the government control of every aspect of your life. What do they mean by common ownership? Everybody, listen, listen to their website, worldsocialism.com. Common ownership will mean everybody having the right to participate in decisions on how global resources will be used. It means nobody being able to take personal control of resources. Democratic control is therefore also essential to the meaning of socialism. All right, you get the rubbish. This is what they teach your children in school. And it's taught by professors who, if they were ripped out of the classroom and given a hot dog stand in Manhattan to run, they'd wind up crying in the streets the next day, not being able to sell a hot dog. They wouldn't know where to buy the hot dog. They wouldn't know how to market the hot dog. They wouldn't know how to keep the hot dog hot. They wouldn't know how to, how to sell the hot dog to the buyer. They'd wind up crying in the street begging for someone to help them. But nevertheless, this is what socialism is as taught in your universities today. So they go down a whole list and they don't understand what they're talking about. Here's what they say. They conclude with this. In socialism, everybody would have free access to the goods and services designed to directly meet their needs. And there need be no system of payment for the work that each individual contributes to producing them. Why don't you tell that to the, what, 95 million Americans who don't work? Why don't you tell that to the bums in New York who are sitting there stoop all day long on a nice day, a drinking beer or smoking a J? All work would be on a voluntary basis. Are you listening to this? 
Wait, they conclude like this. The satisfaction that this would provide, along with the increased opportunity to shape working patterns and conditions, would bring about new attitudes to work. So that means the welfare queen in New York could decide whether to work or not, and she'd have a new attitude if, if she worked one hour a week, let's say, on white privilege somewhere. That would be considered the equivalent work of a ditch digger. So you understand what a crock of rubbish it is, and yet it's gaining traction because of all of the losers in our society. American socialism is having a day in the sun. What do you want to say about this? Why is it becoming popular right now in America? Anne on WABC, do you have an opinion on that? Go ahead, please. Yes, you are so right, Michael. And socialism is the attempt by government to grab all the means of production, to grab total control, and socialism among the individual is the ability to curl up and roll over on your back and give up all personal responsibility and effort. And it's just making me crazy to see what's going on in this country. Yes, and it's because we've had 25 to 30 years of propaganda put out by the universities, by the media, by the government itself about the wonders of socialism. And, and I have to reiterate that left-wing Politicians were defeated across most of the Western world, the only exception being the United States of America. Isn't that astounding? It's horrible. And when I was in college, Arthur Schlesinger, in history class, was lecturing on how beautiful the communes of 19th century Massachusetts were and how this was the future of America. And I walked out of class. I was ready to throw up. Well, there are nice communes that were tried here in America. How'd that work out in the uh, 60s? Yeah, well, none uh, uh, The post-Woodstock generation, many communes popped up in America. Let's see, what did it yield? Chlamydia, homicide, suicide, uh, child rape. I mean, what has any commune produced in this country of any value? Nothing. You look at all the great institutions in this country, every one of them was built by an individual, the great hospitals, the great museums, the great Carnegie Mellons, the NYU, all of these great places were be built and donated by individuals. And when I was a child, doctors worked four days a week in their practice and donated one day a week to work in a hospital for free. But That's interesting. I didn't know that. Really? Most doctors live that? way i didn't know that absolutely and uh because they weren't being taxed to death they were willing to give donations when you take your money at the point of a gun it doesn't make you feel like volunteering to give so and you know what i'm talking about but you're exactly. a person of another generation just as i am the young people are, are naive they're drug addicts most of them they've been raised on medication from the time they're children they're brainwashed in the college in the schoolroom never mind the colleges into this unfairness nonsense, which is now metastasized into this cancer called white privilege, which doesn't exist. Listen, I see it, and that's why I raised this topic. I'm not going to talk about it much longer, but, and I'm sending you a free copy of my best selling book, Countdown to Mecca. It's a novel I'm sure you'll love. I'll be right back. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855 400 Savage. 855 400 7282. Savage. My Savage Nation is sponsored by SwissAmerica.com, the only company I trust to protect my wealth with gold and silver. Call 855. Well, neither one of them have gone as far as uh, I would have liked them to go, and that's one of the reasons why we're seeing the disappearance of the middle class in this country and a huge increase in income and wealth inequality. Uh, that is why uh, All right, we, we are got not the picture. All right, Bernie, get the soapbox here. Yeah, go back to Union Square. We heard it before. But Ari's having a little run now in Nebraska amongst the, the Schmendricks out there. They hear the voice. They think he's an intelligent man. He sold, he, same, he sold his garbage to the people of Vermont. He left the Lower East Side of New York where he couldn't get the first base. He wrote porno stories about raping women. Couldn't get anywhere, a loser, a pothead loser. He goes to Vermont and he bamboozles the poor people of Vermont with the same rhetoric. And the next thing you know, he's the mayor of Burlington. Next thing you know, he's a senator. Now the schmuck thinks he could be president. So where is he uh, doing his speeches? Now he's in some corner of Nebraska where, where they've been shut out from the economy. Headline, justices rule for Muslim denied job over headscarf. Muslim chaplain claims discrimination over Diet Coke weapon aboard United Flight. Would the day be complete without another Muslim complaining story? 
Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Warning, the Savage Nation contains adult language, adult content, psychological nudity. Listener discretion is advised. And now, America's most exciting radio talk show, the Savage Nation, home of unprotected talk, borders, language, culture, and here he is, Michael Savage. Blue Monday. So welcome back to uh, our number two of the Savage Nation. I've been talking about socialism, which seems to be going through a little uh, revival here in America, like a revival tent here and there. You got O'Malley pushing it. You got Elizabeth Warren, but most especially, you have that um, that nut from the Lower East Side of New York, the communist uh, through and through, Bernie Sanders. And Bernie Sanders is out there on the hustings telling everyone how bad America is, pushing for socialism, and what he really wants to do is uh, establish a radical United States government, single-payer health care system. Uh, he would abolish tuition fees for in-state higher education. Everyone should get a free college education. Sounds nice. I would like. I would have liked that. Who would pay for it? You would. He would drive big money out of U.S. politics. No kidding. Tell that to Hillary Clinton. He would redistribute, he would redistribute income. What does that mean? Right now, there's a graduated income tax, which is as fascistic and unfair as, as they come. Why should a high earner pay a higher rate of tax than a low earner? Why shouldn't there be a flat tax? Well, have you thought about that? He would increase Social Security benefits. Now, who doesn't want that? If you're on Social Security, wouldn't you want to increase Social Security benefits? So you can go to an Indian gambling casino and sit there with, with the chips in your hand, with your shaky diabetes arm the upper arm shaking with the flab hanging down, with the cigarette in your mouth and the cup full of chips. He would break up the too-big-to-fail Wall Street banks. As you know, Wall Street's always been a target of people. And he's making believe he's against Wall Street, when in fact, he knows and I know that you get nowhere without Wall Street. And frankly, let's look at Wall Street. It's all not, not that all evil. I mean, they do fund businesses. Most of your new businesses were funded through Wall Street. So what are you talking about? Do they even know what they're talking about? Let me break it down for you. We'll go on to other topics. The next time you're sitting in New York City or San Francisco or Chicago or Washington and um, someone brings up the idea of, you know, socialism's not a bad idea. We really, I really think it would work quite well here. Tink, tink, says the cocktail drinker. So ask them a question. Why is it that when Haitian refugee, refugees risk their lives trying to get to Florida in homemade boats, Florida, remember, from Haiti is almost 500 miles away. Why would they risk 500 miles in an open sea in a broken little homemade boat to get to the evil capitalist empire of America when they could have gone just 50 miles from Haiti to the workers' paradise of Fidel Castro in Cuba? I think that sort of ends the argument. Are the Haitians stupid? Or do they know that this evil capitalist empire called America is the greatest system that was ever created despite all of its flaws. The greatest place where the greatest good for the greatest number uh, happens to prevail. So again, use that analogy. Haitians, homemade boats, fleeing Haiti. Why did they not go 50 miles to the workers' paradise of Cuba under Fidel Castro? Why did they risk their lives and go 500 miles to get to the evil America, the capitalist America? Try that on your college uh, student daughter when she comes home from Harvard. Okay, that's that. Let's finish this one up. Let's finish this, and we'll move on to the other stories that I have on the Savage Nation. WJR Roy, go ahead, please. You're on the Savage Nation. Yes, I uh, appreciated uh, a couple different areas that you talked about in socialism. It has many faces, but when you take a look at Detroit and uh, what Detroit's gone through because of socialism... And, you know, the UAW, the teachers' union, anyone that's in a union is really in a socialistic workplace. And so what happened here, which was a phenomenon uh, last year, I think it was, they voted in for a right-to-work state here 
and I would have never thought that would ever happen here in my lifetime. And what is a right to work state? What does that mean? Okay. All right, it's too complicated. We know that Detroit failed because not so much of socialism, but because of cronyism and corruption. The mayor of Detroit was a gangster and a criminal. He's in jail right now. He destroyed Detroit through uh, grants and contracts to his friends and, and donors. I mean, that's the real reason. Yeah. Let me send you a great Father's Day gift, my novel, Countdown to Mecca, Stay in the Line. Let me explain how profit works and not get, go into much more detail. It's a very simple system. If a business is efficient and successful at serving their product to the public, they are reward, <laughs> rewarded with profits, right? If a business is operated poorly or inefficiently, and it fails to serve the public interest or provides products that people don't like, they're penalized with losses. And that's why people want socialism. It's basically losers who started a business and then said, oh, it's not me, it's not my product. It's the evil system that crushed me, or it's Walmart that crushed me. No, it's because you didn't make a product that anybody wanted. It's the same in any business here in America. For example, NPR is a socialist broadcast network. They couldn't survive, I would say, one year if they were not subsidized by Barack Obama. NPR is an unfair playing field for me. They suck audience because they have no ads. Many of you listen to me and then you listen to NPR. What you don't realize, though, is that they're running a full hour without any ads, so they have a longer uh, uh, audience listenership than I have. I need ads because I'm a capitalist, and my whole show is built upon capitalism. And I am rewarded, or I am punished, by the size of my audience. It's as simple as that. It's a ruthless, dog-eat-dog world that I live in. If my audience dies off, my show dies off. If my audience grows... Uh, I grow. It's that simple. That's capitalism. NPR doesn't face any such thing. They could have the most boring. Da, 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 da. All things considered. Oh, no, I mean all things liberal considered. You mean all things socialist considered. You mean all things lesbian considered. You mean all things gay considered. You mean all things Muslim considered. You mean all things anti-American considered, don't you? But they are rewarded by a socialist system that pays them big, fat salaries for no reason whatsoever. NPR should be defunded by the Republican administration, but we don't have one. So I'm giving you several different examples of socialism versus capitalism, market-driven realities as opposed to central planning. You see, on the central planning of the type Obama and this guy Bernie Sanders would like, there is no profit and loss system of accounting to measure the success or failure of any program. And without profits, how are you going to discipline firms which fail to serve the public interest? And how are you going to reward firms that do serve the public interest? Let's look at Nancy Pelosi's favorite friends in the solar industry. Billions of dollars given to cronies to create solar companies, never disciplined, never served the public interest, and no, virtually no kilowatts produced. Why is that happening? How do they get away with this? They have no competition. That's how the Politburo fu functioned in the Soviet Union. That's how the Democrat Socialist Party works in America. And so what I'm telling you is that we need incentives in order for profits to be created and for losses to be created. Then you'll understand what it is. Now, there's another fatal defect of socialism, and that is the disregard that socialism has for the role of private property rights, uh, period. Private property rights don't exist in a socialist, in a pure socialist government. <clears throat> which is why the Cuban people don't enjoy their own property. It's all owned by the gangsters, the Castro brothers, who Obama cannot get enough of, by the way. What a tragedy this is, that we opened up uh, uh, relations with Cuba without the average Cuba, Cuban citizen getting one iota of, of freedom from it. Now, let's look at commons, the idea of commons lands or things like that nature. In the 16th century, in Britain, Certain grazing lands were communally owned by villages and were made available for public use. Use. Well, that was known as the commons. Everyone could graze on that land. Well, what happened? Well, the common lands were quickly overgrazed and eventually became worthless as villagers exploited the communally owned resource. That's what happens. Greed kicks in. You see, when assets are publicly owned, what are the incentives that are there to encourage a wise maintenance 
of these assets. Whereas private property creates incentives to take care of your land, to conserve your land, to reuse it responsibly. Do you understand that? If everyone in America owned land together, everybody would act as if no one owned it. Take a look at Baltimore. They didn't even own that land. They burnt it to the ground, the thugs that Obama couldn't get enough of. And when no one owns it, no one will, will take care of it. Look at the public housing in America. Look at public housing and how the people abuse it, how they treat it like a, like, what's the word I'm looking for, like, like a cesspool. Why do people in public housing treat their own housing like garbage? Because they don't own it. Why don't they own it? Because they don't have the money to own it. Why don't they have the money to own it? Well, through, either through bad luck or through laziness. Uh, they have no capacity to own anything. So we the people say, all right, look, they can't live in the street. Let's give them some public housing. Well, the least you would figure is they would take care of their housing, but they don't. Take a look at the sad state of public housing projects across America, and you will see exactly how socialism works. That's it. I'll be right back. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. Your Savage Nation is sponsored by SwissAmerica.com. It's the only company I trust for tangible assets, gold and silver. Shortly after the break, we're going to shift topics to Bill Gates's biggest fear, which is that a pandemic will sweep the planet and wipe out 50% of humanity. Uh, I agree with him. Uh, we'll talk about that then. But I want to conclude this discussion of socialism with one remark. I read this in the Foundation for Economic Education. As Peruvian economist Hernando de Soto remarked, you can travel in rural communities around the world and you will hear dogs barking because even dogs understand property rights. It is only statist governments that have failed to understand property rights. You understand the difference? Owning something is akin to reality anywhere on earth. Everybody wants to own something. And what's happening in America is that we've imported so many have-nots and have raised an entire generation of bums and welfare leeches that they have now been become the norm. They think it wasn't bad enough that we had to feed them and clothe them and house them and give them medi medication for their whole lives. Now you've got demagogues like Obama for seven straight years telling them that they're not really losers. They're on the bottom because of fill in the blank, racism, you fill in the blank. And as a result now you've got a lower class, uh, a poor class, however you want to put it, I really don't care how you mince words any way you want, that he's stirring up against the middle class because make no mistake about it, his golf partners are not going to be affected by the rabble. Uh, Obama's fundraising sources are never going to be affected by the rabble. It's you and I, the middle class, that are being affected by the rabble as they are being stirred up by Obama and the leftist minions. Now new ones have come along like Bernie Sanders and Martin O'Malley. Now Hillary is being pushed to the left as a result of these characters. As you well know, she's being drawn farther and farther to the left, which is a very good thing for the rest of us, because America is fundamentally not a left-wing or a left-leaning nation at all. Every election of the recent past has shown us that America is a center-right nation. That's what America actually is. But the, the devils, the evil ones, they have a different game plan. Their game plan is to stir up the hatred on the bottom, to get the bottom feeders to vote. That's number one. Number two is to bring in as many illegal aliens as they can to get them to vote. Number three is to control the voting counting. Who actually counts the votes? As I pointed out a few books ago, I was shocked to learn that the votes are no longer counted in America. They're counted electronically by a company, I believe it was in Germany, I don't even know England somewhere, uh, it's hard to believe what's happened to this country. So the whole thing may be a sham. There may not even be a real election. It could be just a, uh, you know, like a shadow game, like like puppets on a stage. There may not even really be an election. I think Hillary's been chosen already. It doesn't matter if she raises $2 billion or $2.5 billion. It doesn't matter if they find out that she, she stole $10 billion. It wouldn't matter. I think they've already picked her. And so we're living no longer in this free republic. You know that. And many of you have given up, and you don't even care anymore. That's the truth. The apathy has set in, which is exactly how these demagogues win. Once apathy sets in, 
amongst the vigilant. Take a guess who takes over society, right? 855-400-7282. Danny on WBAP in Dallas. Fire away. Go ahead, please. Hi, Michael. I just want to let you know that um, I was shopping in a Walmart in Saginaw, Texas today, and uh, your book was there right on top at eye level, uh, two copies along with all the other bestsellers. Um, everybody else had two copies as well, so I didn't. I just thought I'd uh, shed some good news on you today. Well, what you're saying is the book is selling. I know it is. It's actually selling very, very well. It had two very good weeks. Countdown to Mecca is a bestseller. And yet, of course, the evildoers at the New York Times have made believe it, it doesn't exist. It outsold four books that they put on their bestseller list. Go figure that one out. If you can't count on the New York Times to even produce an honest bestseller list, can you count on any of their political opinions? No. <laughs> no. Well, you know, no, you can't. It just shows you how tr tricky the whole world has become. And I promoted the book fairly good. I'm not pushing it very hard. Here's what I feel. I feel the book is so good that as people read Countdown to Mecca, they're going to talk about it with their friends and their friends and their friends' friends, and they're going to buy him for Father's Day for a gift for the brother, the father, the husband, because I think it's a great read and also has a great political message. It's a political thriller novel. But you stay in the line, Danny. I'll be sending you one in either case. Let's go back. There's one caller I want to get to who says socialism does work. John on WABC, go ahead, please. Yeah, no, I don't say it works, but I say that there's always the argument on the other side. They mentioned Switzerland as being a place where it works. Right, and how many immigrants does Switzerland have? Probably none. Uh, how many different ethnic groups does Sweden, uh, Switzerland have? Switzerland is a homogeneous nation where everyone knows everybody. They're sort of related. Right. And so they all, they all have a sense of pride in their nation, uh, and they, uh, let's say, don't have the same problems uh, that we have here as a result of our diversity and a result of our great diversity. I mean, diversity has been a great, great addition to America, isn't it? Bringing in so many people from Africa, for example, or bringing in as many people as you can who are Muslim, who will never assimilate to this country. Never. Can you name one country where Muslims have been brought in en masse, where they've assimilated to the, to the uh, host nation? Name one nation where when Muslims were brought in as immigrants, they assimilated to the values of the nation. Can you name one nation? When I come back, Bill Gates on a coming epidemic as his greatest fear. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. Well, we've been talking about why socialism is going through a sort of revival in America right now and how although it's been rejected around the world in most uh, Western nations, uh, here in America it seems to be enjoying some kind of renaissance as a result of the double talkers and the phonies who are promising uh, so much to people, of course, that they can never deliver on. It's worked before for demagogues. I doubt very much it's going to work for them, but nevertheless, we're going to have to listen to this hot air for a while. I want to move to the topic of epidemics right now in health and that is because uh, last week I stumbled upon a piece of an interview with Bill Gates who is a, has to be one of the most intelligent men on the planet and his greatest fear he says he looked at the spike of deaths in the last century and you know there was a huge spike of millions of deaths in World War One for obvious reasons men were killing each other but what you don't know is that there was a bigger spike after World War One of deaths in the 1920s uh, or the late 19s uh, from the Spanish flu. It wiped out millions of people in the world, the Spanish flu did. And he then goes on to this century and he looks ahead and he's a visionary, obviously, Bill Gates. And he says his greatest fear, however remote it is, is that a pandemic will occur which mankind cannot control, which will wipe out 50% of humanity. So I, I've been thinking about that especially since I like to believe that I take care of myself. I like to believe that I know an awful lot about epidemiology. I avoid, I avoid the obvious, you know, locuses of infection, loci of infection, you want to put it that way. And I know well enough to stay away from people who are sick. That's common sense. I wash my hands. I'm an in, in, inveterate hand washer. Whenever I come in from being outside, I take my shoes off and wash my hands. I'm fanatical about it. I always have been. And I've been fairly lucky and have enjoyed pretty good health. 
Well, last week I got hit with a flu, and I was sicker than I've been since I'm a child. It was something I've never encountered as an adult. I was doubled over in pain from a sore throat, which secondary infection, I got a strep throat. No matter what amount of vitamins I used, I could not get on top of this flu, at least for a few days. It was raging in me, and I was frightened from it. From it. Well, eventually I had to use antibiotics to stop the strep throat infection. And I continued mega doses of vitamin A, vitamin C, herbs. You can't believe the homeopathic treatments I found that actually worked to suppress the cough. The cough was so bad, I thought I would break a rib. I spoke with another friend last night, by the way, a big burly man who also got hit. He said, when he had it, he said the coughs were so bad, he thought he would, his ribs would break. That's how bad it was. So you can still hear it in me. I don't have 100% back. I'm back to about ah, 70% now, 75 I can feel it in my delivery. My mind is sharp, but I'm not, my delivery's not there. I don't have the wind power yet. Now, a normal person wouldn't have gone back to work for three weeks. Uh, a person on tenure who is retired at my age wouldn't work at all. He probably spent three to four months recovering from the flu I just got through, and I was back on, <laughs> back on the air in two days. So the point is, is that the best laid plans of mice and men and all that we can assume that we know what to do to prevent illness and death, but we all know what's waiting for us. And eventually, it catches up to all of us. No matter how strong we are or smart we are, it catches up to us. So let's listen in right now to Bill Gates's very rational fears about the, coming, uh, the possible coming epidemic. Why don't you describe for me, as vividly as you can, what it is you're worried about, and what it is that the nightmare scenario looks like. Fortunately, there's very few things, and most of them are very low probability. Uh, you know, some big volcanic explosion, uh, gigantic earthquake, asteroid. But at least in the nuclear case, you've got to say we take it quite seriously. We budget a lot of money, have a lot of people who think about nuclear deterrence, and I'm very glad that work's being done, and I rate the chance of a nuclear war in my lifetime as being fairly low. Uh, I rate the chance of a widespread epidemic far worse than Ebola in my lifetime is well over 50%. If we look at the 20th century and we look at the death chart of the 20th century, I think everybody would say, oh yeah, there must be a spike for World War I. You know, sure enough, there it is, like 25 million. And there must be a big spike for World War II, and there it is, it's like 65 million. But then you'll see this other spike that is as large as World War II, right after World War I. And most people, a lot of people would say, well, what? <laughs> what was that? There's two kinds of flus. There's flus that spread between humans very effectively. And there's flus that kill lots of people. And those two properties have only been combined uh, into a, a widespread flu once in history. Well, that is Spanish flu. We have no idea where it came from. It's called the Spanish flu because the Spanish press was the freest. They were the first to talk openly about it. And so in the annals of epidemic history, that's the big event. I funded a disease modeling group that uses computer simulation. And that work has been phenomenal in helping us target our polio eradication resources and you know, which parts of Nigeria should we work harder on. And it's very natural, if you have a group like that, to say, hey, look at something like the Spanish flu in the modern day. Health systems are far better. And so you think, hey, that wouldn't be very bad. Well, we tried it, and, and there are some assumptions we had to make. But what we showed is that the force of infection because of modern transport, which compared to 1918 is over 50 times as great. And so if you get something like the flu, and you look at that map, of how within days, it's basically in all urban centers of the entire globe. That is very uh, uh, eye-opening. That didn't happen with Spanish flu in the past. The opportunity to do more than just let it run its course is really only in the last decade. Basically, when you talk about drugs, you can talk about small molecules or talk about these complex biological protein-like things, of which there's a subclass called antibodies. Antibodies are the molecules that the immune system naturally builds to attack disease. 
Today, the idea that somebody says, oh, here's an antibody, make a lot of it, make it very quickly, that's right on the cutting edge. And the Ebola epidemic showed me that we're not ready for a serious epidemic, an epidemic that would be more infectious and would spread faster than Ebola did. This is the greatest risk of a huge tragedy. This is the most likely thing by far to kill over 10 million excess people in a year. We don't need to invest nearly what we do in military preparedness. This is something where less than a billion a year on R&D, medical surveillance, uh, standby personnel, cross-training the military so they can play a role in terms of all the logistics here. This can be done, and we may not get many more warnings like this one to, to say, okay, it's a pretty modest investment to avoid right. something that really, in terms of the, the human condition, would be a, a gigantic right. setback. All right, so one of the most brilliant men of our time, Bill Gates, on infection, infectious disease, and he mentions the big spike in deaths in the human population from the Spanish flu during the 1918 pandemic. Did you know that approximately 50 million people died from this epidemic? I'll bet you don't even know this. And it, it affected 20 to 40% of the worldwide population became ill, an estimated 50 million people died from the Spanish flu, which occurred right after World War I. In fact, that influenza pandemic of 1918-1919 killed more people than the First World, World War did. It's astounding to uh, look at a thing like this. Now, one of the statements that Mr. Gates made, which I found interesting, was he was uh, actually quite interested to say that the force of infection is so much greater now because of transport alarm bells went off in my head. He said the force of infection is much greater now because of transport. And yet here's a man who's in favor of open borders. Here is a man who knows what open borders can and are doing to our the health of the nation. And yet because he is driven solely by the profit motive in the case of his business, not from his ch charity work, he doesn't understand that when he says the force of infection has become greater because of transport, that he should do something about the transport of people across borders in order to lower the risk of such uh, a pandemic. Do you understand what I'm saying? I think it's a very important point. And so we never talk about this because you figure, what can I do about it? Many people who caught the Spanish flu did not die from it, but they often died from complications caused by bacteria such as pneumonia. 50 million people died. And uh, we have right now in America, on a minor level, a minor pandemic of a flu virus that came in with Obama's children from Central America last summer. Do you remember what Obama did, as devious and as evil as he is? Do you remember what he did? He went around the laws of the nation, the laws of medicine, the laws of epidemiology, the laws of humanity. And in order to push his left-wing radical agenda... He brought it over 100,000, God knows how much more, how many more than that, at least 100,000 women and children, some men snuck in with them from Honduras, from El Salvador, some Guatemala, by the trainload. Many of them came in with infections, Ask the Border Patrol. This was hushed up almost immediately. They brought into this country a rather unknown virus known as the EDV-68 virus, which rapidly spread through the children population amongst our child population, killing children, paralyzing children, infecting children across America, where these children of Obamas were placed in local schools. You don't know any of this, because the Bob Schieffers of the world refused to report on the immigrants and epidemics. Now, on a very personal level, I've been through flu seasons before. I've never gotten sick, never. Remember how many years I've been on the radio? Have you ever heard me have the flu in my 20 years? Never. How many years have I told you I would never take a flu vaccine? Like every year? Why? Because they're ineffective. Number two, they uh, cultivate the, uh, the vaccine from strains that they think might occur, and yet often they're, they're wrong, so they're useless. <laughs> well, I never took a flu vaccine, and I don't intend to take one now. Why am I bringing that up? Because I got hit this year. And I'm sure I got hit by a strain of the EDV-68 virus, which is probably mutated by now. It's a rapidly mutating virus. In the San Francisco area where, where I live, I have not met one person who I don't run into, even casually says, Mike, I heard you were sick on the radio. I hope you're better. And by the way, I had it. Or Mike, 
I know someone who had it and lasted three weeks. I couldn't kick the cough. The cough stayed with me. It's, a, it's an epidemic raging through the San Francisco area that is swept under the rug by the vermin in the media and by the vermin in the public health departments, all of whom are, are war criminals as far as I'm concerned. Everybody in public health is in a conspiracy to hide the epidemic that was brought into America by Barack Insane Obama. And on that note, I'll take a quick break and be right back. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. Hey, our Savage Nation is sponsored by SwissAmerica.com, the only company I trust for wealth insurance, gold and silver. Call 800 800- In the first two hours of this program tonight, I've been talking about the plague of socialism and the actual plague called the Spanish flu outbreak of 1918 to 1920, which killed about 50 million people worldwide, conservative, liberal, black, white, Hispanic, Asian, didn't matter, gay, straight. As I said many, many decades ago, microbes do not discriminate. And in the next hour, I'm going to talk about the smoking gun of the origins of this deadly pandemic. It's very important. One last call this hour, though, on socialism. Bill on WMAL, go ahead, please. Yes, um, Mr. Savage, I just wanted to bring up the fact that in 1948, when Israel was first given, formed into a country, into a state, they had total socialism because they had to absorb hundreds and hundreds and thousands of people into a very small country. And uh, I'm not saying it's going to work now, but at that time... That's That's right. And as a matter of fact, this is an interesting story. Of course, Israel was a welfare state from the beginning, supported largely by the United States and by European nations, or else it couldn't have survived a day. It lived on uh, on handouts. It was not self-sufficient as a socialist state. You're not arguing that, are you? No, I'm not. No, in other words, it was a basket case. It had its hand out. But let's go back for a moment. This is a very interesting piece of history. People often wonder why Israel, why the, by the Soviet Union at that time, voted yes on creating the state of Israel in 1947, 1948. The reason is, is that Israel was founded as a socialist nation, and Russia wanted another socialist nation in the UN. You know that, right? Yes, I do. People don't realize that that was it not for Russia's vote on the Security Council, there would be no state of Israel. It's a very interesting side note of history, which luckily for my listeners, I have a vast knowledge of. But that's a side note. But uh, you, I don't think you're arguing that that Israel being a socialist nation was an example of its uh, viability as a socialist nation. It certainly couldn't have survived without the uh, the welfare of the United States of America, which goes on to this day, incidentally. And it's long overdue that we considered not giving Israel or Egypt or any of those other nations 10 cents. It's time they all stood on their own, their own two feet. I'm sick and tired of my taxes going so they can take vacations in New York at Macy's. Anyway, I'm sending you a free copy of, you know the name of my novel? Because if you do, you'll get it. If you don't, you don't get it. Okay, and... Um, <laughs> what, what's, the name, what's the name of my novel? You've got to name it to gain it. Okay, um... I got it. I was- sorry. Ah, sorry. We're going to run a contest right now. If I ask you to name it to get the free copy, you've got to say Countdown to Mecca. Sorry. Uh, WMAL, Liz, you've got the last call of the day. Go ahead, please. Fire away. Hi, Mr. Savage. I wanted to talk to you about this flu epidemic that's been going around. Uh, earlier this year, my fiancé and I, neither of us do flu vaccines. Where, where we believe in vaccinating kids for things like polio and and all that stuff, because that's something you need to vaccinate for. But I have never had the flu without a flu vaccine. Um, and every time I get a flu vaccine, I get horribly sick. Right. This year, we both wound up getting some strain of flu. Right. It came with horrible bouts of diarrhea for him and vomiting for him. And where, where do you live? Where in the Washington, D.C. area do you live? Uh, I'm in Manassas, or as some of us call it there, Little Mexico. Uh, there's tons Thank of- you. Thank you. Immigrants and epidemics. Obama's massive influx over last summer, mainly children and women from Honduras, brought into America a rare, at that time, rare virus known as the EDV-68 virus, which has now disseminated across America. The man committed a crime against humanity and got away with it, all to push his agenda. All to push his radical agenda of stuffing the Democrat polls with future voters 
in the United States of this America. I'll be back to talk about the pandemic of 1918 that killed 50 million people right here on The Savage Nation. Join The Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE. Warning, The Savage Nation contains adult language, adult content, psychological nudity. Listener discretion is advised. And now, America's most exciting radio talk show, The Savage Nation, home of unprotected talk, borders, language, culture. And here he is, Michael Savage. Blue Monday, I'm a high blue Monday. Got to work, like a slave all day. All right, yeah, hour number three. We all made it to hour number three. Well, we've been talking about the um, pandemic of socialism that has largely died out around the world and is going through a sort of, uh, how shall I say, resurgence in America in certain circles. It's always been under the surface with the malcontents and the university crowds, you know, the ones who live on tenure and resent everyone around them. Uh, But now you've got this Bernie Sanders character running around talking about the wonders of socialism, and you've got Elizabeth Warren, another university type, talking about the wonders of socialism. So we talked about socialism, and uh, I I left you with one apt example. The next time you have this discussion with anyone, break it down to this. Ask your great socialist friend, Uh, in an argument, why is it that Haitians, when they flee their horrible nation and they're in makeshift boats, why did they go 500 miles to the evil capitalist nation of America instead of 50 miles to the wonders of socialist Cuba? That usually ends the argument. And uh, there are many other examples. Wherever socialism has been tried, it's failed. And as Margaret Thatcher said, Socialism is a wonderful economic system that works until you run out of other people's money. We then segued from the epidemic of socialism, the epidemic of socialism, to Bill Gates' fear that a new pandemic will occur, which will wipe out 50% of humanity. And we were focused on the so-called Spanish flu of 1918, 1919, which killed uh, 50 million people. It's It's a little known fact. Very few people know that. 50 million people died in the 1918 flu pandemic. Someone called my call screener and said, could you ask Dr. Savage to explain the difference between the word epidemic and pandemic? A pandemic is fundamentally an epidemic that's more widely spread, sort of spread throughout the world. That would be a pandemic. For example, the AIDS pandemic, because it occurred and occurs all over the world. While an epidemic is something that occurs in a localized situation or a localized community, such as there was a flu epidemic in my town or there was an epidemic of blank in my town. See, that's the difference between epidemic and pandemic. The pandemic derives from epidemic. The global flu outbreak of 1918 killed 50 million people around the world. It was one of the greatest, uh, deadliest epidemics in history. But people have been trying to find out where in the world the pandemic began. And people say, well, the Spanish flu. Well, it it had nothing to do with Spanish flu. The deadly Spanish flu, which is what it was called, uh, claimed more lives than World War I, which, by the way, ended the same year that the pandemic struck, which led people to believe that it had originated in the trenches of World War I. But according to a wonderful article in National Geographic, research is now placing the flu's emergence in a forgotten episode of World War I, which was the shipment of Chinese laborers across Canada in sealed train cars. Historian Mark Humphreys of Canada's Memorial University of Newfoundland wrote that newly unearthed records confirm that one of the side stories of the war, the mobilization of 96,000 Chinese laborers to work behind the British and French lines on World War I's Western Front, may have been the source of the pandemic. pandemic. And they're looking into, you know, trying to isolate some of the uh, material from from that period, meaning viral samples from flu victims, which still exist. And uh, once they examine the viral samples from flu flu victims from that period, 
they would able would be able to tie the disease's origin to one location. However, many experts are now finding this argument convincing. They think it is as close to a smoking gun as any historian is going to get. And that's just in case you're interested in where the 1918 flu pandemic came from. Now, many of you are older people who probably knew people who died from the f- flu pandemic, or you heard from your grandfather about someone who died from the flu epidemic. It affected virtually everybody on the planet in some way or another through, the, <laughs> through their family. And what's odd about that pandemic was that flu epidemic of 1918 killed even the young and the healthy. What this virus did was it turned their strong immune systems against themselves in a way that was unusual for flu. It operated almost like the later uh, AIDS epidemic, turning the strong immune system of the victim against the victim itself. Very unusual for a flu. And so that's an interesting side note. The origins, again, are something that's being debated to this day. I want to do something of entertainment for you, though, on the Savage Nation. I know that you don't want to talk about dying and death and disease and flus and pandemics. So I'm going to read you a page from my exciting novel, Countdown to Mecca, just to give you a flavor of the book. It's a great Father's Day gift, by the way, if you're thinking about it. Go and buy one or go to Amazon. So we're now near the end of the book, and without giving away the plot, there's a dialogue between my character, Jack Hatfield, and a few of his friends. And one of his friends is a cohort named Doc. Hey, you okay? He heard Jack looked over to see Doc approaching while the chauffeur was moving in the opposite direction. You were quivering like a kitten dreaming of a pit bull. That's kind of how I feel, Jack grumbled, then groaned as he tried to sit up. The awkward position had given him a crick in his neck. It wasn't a pit bull, he muttered. It was worse. It was Brooks' worst fear. Which was what? Islam taking over America, Doc suggested, planting his haunch on the side of the desk. Uh, Good guess. You just started all those anti-commie films they used to show us in school playing in my head, Doc said. Hey, if the threat from Islam is any any indication, maybe we all had more to fear from the Reds than we realized. Yeah, Jack said, but the joke's on us. Who could have known we'd end up with a president who would slip us a pinko Mickey under the guise of social reform? Well, we're back to agreeing with one another, Doc Grin. But given it was your maze-like brain at work, I doubt your dream left it at that. Right again, Jack said, digging the heels of his palms into his eyes. I think my subconscious was warning me that if Mecca doesn't go, the real danger was a U.S. government shutdown being used as a pretext for a takeover. By who? By sleepers strategically placed around the seats of power. Wow, Doc began to disparage the idea, but then his lips and eyes narrowed. I dreamed of arrests of congressmen for doing their jobs, Jack mused. The appeals to patriotism in the face of a manufactured crisis. I've seen all this before. A debt ceiling battle would lead to the imposition of emergency powers by the president. Take over the purse strings completely, and there would no longer be a check on the presidency. He looked up at Doc. They called Nixon administration the imperial presidency, but that would be child's play compared to this. Doc slowly nodded, but instead of supporting Jack's new theory, he said, Look, you're adding more trees, Jack. We don't need more trees. We got plenty of trees already. Jack considered that. Are we missing the forest? Doc jutted out his chin. Yeah, they're being blocked by a German industrialist, a fake base in the desert, and a pit of dead bodies. Jack stood and shook his head just ajar his thinking. Some people see what they want to see. Some people see what they need to see. And too many people in authority explain away what they do see. Doc pondered that. Doc remembered the time he was hunting in the back forests of Northern California and became hopelessly lost. Because he tried to rely only on his instincts, not on his instruments like a simple compass. He remembered following a stream down a mountain until it ran into a slightly bigger stream. He was sure this would eventually lead him to an open clearing and back to where he wanted to go. Instead, he recalled how his heart dropped when the last stream led him not to a clearing, but to a wide raging river too deep and too fast to cross. The feeling of absolute terror and hopelessness. The understanding in a flash through his bowels that his instincts had led him to a fatal miscalculation. Doc asked, if there isn't another explanation for what we've seen and heard, what is the answer? Who was it who said that once you eliminate the impossible, whatever remains, no matter how improbable, has to be the truth? I I think it was Sherlock Holmes, Doc said. Eliminating the impossible is not going to be that easy after our interview with Brooks. Doc shook his own head now, seemingly overwhelmed by the possibilities. An empty empty bomb. Maybe a missing bomb, Jack mused. Anyway, I'll pause right there. uh, That's on page 305 of Countdown to Mecca. 
And that little story of getting lost in the forest without a compass and reverting to his instincts by Doc is unfortunately a true story told to me by a man just like Doc. So as I say, fiction is interesting, especially when it's based upon reality. And I hope you'll check out a copy of Countdown to Mecca, A Great Father's Day uh, Gift. 855-407-282, time for a quick call or two on the Savage Nation. Paul on uh, WABC Radio in New York City. Go ahead, please, Paul. What's on your mind? Uh, Michael, uh, social, uh, socialism is the new capitalism, in my opinion. Um, well, what does that mean by socialism is the new capitalism? What does that mean? To me, what it means is that it's become an industry where the leadership... What do you mean, like Nancy Pelosi gives out grants to build solar plants that produce virtually no electricity for billions of dollars? It's on many levels. The uh, economic justice movement leadership, uh, which uh, for six years could have uh, challenged Barack Obama in the White House because they can pick up the phone and call him. Any okay, but I don't know what you. I don't know what you're arguing. You're saying socialism is the new capitalism. You mean in the form? You mean crony capitalism? Right. Where Nancy, you mean Nancy Pelosi and the others who speak a lot about global warming are doing it for self-interest, obviously, right. because there, there's billions of dollars at stake in grants and contracts. Is that what you're saying? Correct, sir. And they are very capable. The leadership of each of these factions of self-interest are very capable of convincing. People that are not in good shape financially. Right, I understand. Right. They'll go to the poorest of the poor and tell them that the rich are getting richer. And meanwhile, it's the rich who are doing their business with them. They're doing their business with the rich, only the very rich. Exactly. Well, we have uh, uh, who, who is it that Obama plays golf with? The thugs of Baltimore or the very rich who support his campaigns and the campaigns of his cronies and feather his nest? Who is it who Bill Clinton associates with, the poor of Baltimore or, or the people who give him $50,000 a minute for a speech? All right, my friend, we got a question for you. If you can name my novel's title, you get a free copy. What's its name? What's the title? Countdown to Mecca, but I'd like... Oh, oh, one man with a memory is all it takes. Stay on the line. Free copy goes out to you. 855 400 7282 is the phone number. You're listening to The Savage Nation. We've been talking about the rise of socialism. We're talking about the 1918 flu pandemic. We're talking about Obama bringing in 100,000 people from Honduras last summer, many of them infected with the EDV-68 virus. All this and more right here on The Savage Nation. Join The Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. My Savage Nation is sponsored by SwissAmerica.com. It's the only company I trust to protect my wealth. Call 800. It is The Savage Nation. There is another left-winger on the rise, Martin O'Malley, who I call the American Putin. Let's listen to Martin O'Malley in clip two. We need to prosecute cheats. We need to reinstate Glass-Steagall. And if a bank is too big to fail without wrecking our nation's economy, then we need to break it up before it breaks us again. I never heard O'Malley till I listened to the sound clips. His voice is too, uh, too tinny to attract any attention. But nevertheless, he says, let's reinstate Glass-Steagall. I actually agree with that. It's one of the principles in my book, Trickle Up Poverty, from a couple of years ago. And many of you don't know what Glass-Steagall is. This act, instituted in 1933, required the separation of commercial and investment banks. It's very simple. It required commercial and investment banks to be separated. It was repealed in 1999 by Bill Clinton's Treasury Secretary. I think his name was Rubin. And it was one of the key factors leading to the breakdown of the residential mortgage investment sector. I totally agree it needs to be reinstated. We also need to reinstate the Wall Street uptick rule because we have out-of-control speculation right now that is unhealthy and very dangerous and should lead to another collapse. But let's not get too specific. Let's listen to Bernie Sanders in clip 32, and you listen to the demagogue himself. When people are prepared to fight back, there is nothing that cannot be accomplished. We can live in a country where every person has health care yeah, yeah, is yeah. a right, yeah, not a privilege. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We yeah, can yeah. live in a country where every person, no matter no matter their race, yeah, their yeah, religion, yeah, yeah. their right, disability, right. or their sexual right, right. orientation, 
realizes the full promise of equality that yeah, is yeah. our birthright as Americans. That yeah, you're is full of it. the nation. You stink we like a rotten corned beef sandwich. Shut him together. up. He smells like an old corned beef sandwich fell out of a truck off Katz's back truck. Are you kidding me? Let me tell you something, old Bernie, and you know it better than anybody. We've heard this equality crap before, and I'll tell you the truth, Bernie. I wrote a little line about 30 years ago when I was shafted by affirmative action. You know what it was, what is entitled, Bernie? I wrote one simple line. Without quality, we cannot have equality. Don't fool yourself. Not everybody is equal. Oh, we may be born equal, but are we? Are we really born equal? Are you telling me I could be a linebacker? Can you tell me the average linebacker can be a talk show host? Of course not, Bernie. We're snowflakes, Bernie. But socialism would like us all turned into slush. How's that for a line? I see that socialism is on the rise here in America, which is amazing to me, given that Bernie Sanders is a clear, classic uh, 1930s New York Lower East Side communist on a soapbox. And yet he seems to be stirring up a little uh, attention here and there. I mean, he got 400 people in Nebraska, and they said he's getting great crowds. If I gave a speech, I can get 30,000 people. And the New York Times would ignore the crowds the same way they're ignoring my novel. But forget about me for a minute. I want to talk about socialism. Many of you think you're a socialist or you want to be socialist because you think it's fair. You see the kids coming out of the colleges with their brains washed, believing in socialism. They don't even know what it means. But they think it's a good thing where everybody will be equal and everybody will be fair. Now, we've had six or seven years of the phony in the White House pushing this lie while living, I would say, a richer life than any president in American history, classic socialism, by the way, which is feed the people the garbage they want to hear and then live high on the hog. Why is socialism suddenly gaining traction in America right now? Not only have America's moral views moved to the left over the last number of years, but America's political views are moving to the left over the last couple of years. And you have to go back to reality to understand that socialism has never worked. Wherever it has been tried, it has never worked. Again, I point to Cuba. Look to the ex-Soviet Union. Ask your Russian neighbor how life was like in the United Socialist States, uh, United Soviet uh, Republic, USSR. How did that work out for all of the socialists? in all of the republics that were under the banner of those in the Kremlin. Well, they live very poorly while those in government live very richly, very much like today. Government uh, agents live very, very well in this country and abuse the taxpayer as often as they could because a fish rots from the head down. As you all know, Obama has rotted the fish uh, from the head down. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-400. Wealthy special interests here at home have used our government to create in our own country yeah, an yeah, economy yeah. that is leaving a majority of our people behind, yeah, an economy yeah, yeah. that has so concentrated wealth and power in the hands of the very few yeah, yeah, that yeah. it has taken opportunity out of the homes of the many. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And who do you hang around with? The, the thugs of uh, Baltimore or the ones who have taken the uh, opportunity out of the homes of many, Mr. O'Malley? Who would you invite to dinner recently? Who came to the O'Malley household recently? Was it the thugs of Baltimore who burned the city to the ground? Or was it the powerful that he hates so much? What a bunch of garbage. All of these politicians are playing the, the demagogue act right now because it's worked for the con man in the White House so well. They figure, you know, I may as well get on in the act. So now they're espousing naked socialism, which has been tried in many, many places. And uh, I don't know where it's worked. Maybe someone can enlighten me. Uh, I've heard so much about socialism my entire life, and here's something I've also noticed amongst the, art the artists and bohemians who are all socialists at heart as they sit around in their fat behinds uh, drinking a glass of wine in a cafe, let's say, in San Francisco somewhere instead of working during the day. They sit and talk about the, uh, they extol the benefits of socialism and what a great nation it would be if it were a socialist nation and how, how they are anti-capitalist. But at the hint of a dollar, at the smell of a buck, at the hint of a contract, at the smell of a grant, they will jump out of that cafe chair so fast that the entire table goes over, knocking over the bottles and glasses themselves. But what is socialism? What actually is socialism? 
is the question. Well, socialism means that the government takes over the direct control and management of the industries and social services by the workers. What does that mean? Are you telling me that the government is going to take over farming? Would the government taking over farms produce more and better crops? Because I'm starting with something obvious. You know and I know that that was tried in the Soviet Union in the 1930s, where they started to debase the uh, Soviet farmers, the Russian farmers. They called them kulaks, very much like Obama has started to come up with a phrase called white privilege in order to attack white people. The universities have been putting out this racist garbage for a few years now. And so they started by uh, demonizing the farmers in the Soviet Union, calling them kulaks, meaning profiteers in essence. And what happened soon thereafter was the people started to say, yeah, yeah, those damn farmers, they're making too much money. Now, remember, so the Soviet Union was the breadbasket of the entire region for, for a long period of time. They were producing wheat. They were self-sufficient. They were able to feed themselves and export many products, including wheat, around the world. Once the government took over the farms, the government, in its typical fashion of mismanagement, mismanaged the farms. Crop production fell. Food production fell. Food distribution fell. There was mass starvation, and 30 million people died. This is what happens whenever a government takes over a private industry. It cannot do it better. It does it worse. Do you understand this? Do you understand how this works? Now, many of the bums listening to this show don't work for a living, but they hate those of us who do work for a living. They're green with envy. They're green with envy because they think that we stole it from them. They think that they're on the bottom because we took it from them. They think that we on the top took it from them. Where did they get this foolish idea from? From Barack Obama and the media and the universities. The fact of the matter is, there are always winners and losers in every country, in every society, in every tribe, in every village. I've lived in primitive villages. And in the smallest villages that I've lived in, in the Fiji Islands, uh, I've seen those who were chiefs. I've seen those who were princes and princesses in the, in the, in the familial line. And I've seen those at the very bottom. There's no equality on this earth whether it be in the animal kingdom or in the human kingdom. There never has been and there never will be equality. Does this mean that we should let those on the bottom starve to death? Can you tell me of anyone who is starving to death in America? We have an obesity epidemic amongst the poor in this country. No, we should take care of the poor. We should take care of the weak. We should take care of the sick. Uh, however, we shouldn't take care of the world's poor, uh, the world's sick and the world's weak. We can't hardly take care of our own domestic variety of parasite. So let's be clear. When I was a child and I would drive around in my father's car on the way to work, I would look at everything and observe as a smart child does, whatever the race or religion of a child, that shall I, a child will observe. And I used to hate working. I hated going to work. I hated, resented it like you can't believe. I didn't like working. I wanted to stay home and play with my friends. My father was an immigrant and he wanted to teach me the work ethic. So he made me go to work on the weekends and we drive in his old cars. Well, they were a couple of years old over the Kosciuszko Bridge from Queens at that time into Manhattan to his store on the Lower East Side on Ludlow Street. And I would observe human life as I went by the tenements, the uh, old apartments in the in the Williamsburg area, Greenpoint, which are, uh, now you pay a million dollars for a junky apartment. But nevertheless, I would observe and I would say, wouldn't it be nice, I would imagine, if there was no money in the world? This is a child's view now. This is how socialists think. This is how college professors think. Wouldn't it be nice if there was no means of trade called money? And I said, what if the man went to work every day and my father just gave away his merchandise to people and exchanged it, I thought, let's say for food or for gasoline or for a car. I thought that would be nice. Nobody would have to work too hard. Everybody would just exchange goods. But then I said, wait a minute. What happens, I thought, if some guys don't want to work as hard as the other guy? Well, what if some guys don't want to work at all? And then I realized that I was not a socialist. Unfortunately, Bernie Sanders never, never had that moment. He never realized that there are some people who are lazy or cheats. And as a result of that, he doesn't understand the real world. So you have to ask yourself, why is socialism suddenly on the rise in America? Why are people interested in this? Left-wing politicians are in retreat across the entire Western world, except in the United States. Did you know that? They're in retreat in France, Germany, Italy, 
England. They've gotten defeated in all of these nations. The left-wingers have been thrown out of office in most of the Western world. But in the United States, there seems to be an infatuation with socialism, as exemplified by this Lower East Side street agitator, Bernie Sanders, who seems to be running at 15% in the Democratic polls. He's rioting higher than any U.S. socialist since Eugene Debs ran for the White House 100 years ago. Now, it's unlikely he'll unseat Hillary Clinton. She's got too much money. But he is dragging her to the left. I got an email from a man a couple of weeks ago. Remember an artist called the show, and I asked him to send me a picture of his pictures. And this pops up. And he goes on and on about radio. And he says, look, Michael, I have to say this, Dr. Savage. First about radio. As a boy, I built Heathkit radio receivers and kept my own radio at the head of my bed, overlooking the stand of blue spruce trees outside my window in Michigan. That little radio of mine had drift. It slowly moved its tuning focus down the bandwidth by itself, pulling in stations slowly far away through the night as it kept me company. Listen to this. It's beautiful. In those days, the radio shows were so unique and memorable. Arthur Godfrey, country evangelists, corn prices, late night baseball doubleheaders under arc lamps, Tennessee Ernie Ford, hogbacks, prairie philosophers, the lot. It became the subliminal tapestry of sounds in the background of my youth. So I have a special affection for radio, and I listen to you, Dr. Savage, on the Drake S8 receiver or my little Grundig G5 portable, which is the portable shortwave receiver I always take to Europe. Your show is really like a radio Chautauqua, where you mix current events, recipes for meatballs, politics, sports, and art, and your own memories of times past, as Proust would say. I know that other radio hosts have criticized your format and your popularity, but this sense that you have, what Kipling calls the common touch, is so important to conveying your message. A spoonful of sugar makes the medicine go down, so to speak. Secondly, Dr. Savage, when you mentioned Lysenko, I almost spilled my coffee, because no one I know has mentioned him since I did my Russian studies years ago and understood what a dogmatic and ideological disaster the Soviet regime was. Then you mentioned Emmanuel Velikovsky, and I actually did spill my coffee on the carpet. When you spoke last week about the rise of the Nazis, I had to call to relate how the Wilson Doctrine so harmed the peace after World War I because it created a formula, a formula for equating national self-determination with races such that the liberals were quite unable to withstand Hitler's demand for reincorporating ethnic Germans from other nation states into a great Third Reich. The same liberal philosophy of using racial metrics to define communities or areas of separation are still a beloved tool of the liberal political class, much like the liberals and labor socialists in Churchill's time. <clears throat> in fact, it was a bit of a parlor game in England before World War I to try to draw a map on the tablecloth of how the dinner guests would reapportion the Balkans, and on and on. Lately, your motto, Michael Savage, borders language and culture, has always appeared to me to be more than a conservative touchstone or shibboleth, although it certainly is that externally. But if one understands that same formula as it were internally, what an immense guiding light it becomes, because borders can be understood to be about personal borders, and filling those borders with the most positive content one can achieve, as well as setting oneself apart, not letting others unduly influence you or overrun your borders. Language is not just to speak American, but to speak our mother tongue English in the most correct and literate manner, to be well-read and gracious in delivery and debate. Finally, culture to be personally cultured in both the local and international senses, to behave and live in a cultured manner, no matter what economic standard one obtains. These guidelines are as applicable to modern America as to Edwardian England or Cicero's Rome. Michael, borders, language, and culture are what makes us well-rounded, accomplished, and social in the most correct and far-reaching manner, he writes, they are to live by. This is one man's email to me. I'll read the last paragraph. Thank you for sending me your latest Jack Hatfield novel, Countdown to Mecca. I have enjoyed the first two and your other works, most especially the coming Civil War, are favorites of mine. If you like anything in my works below, I'll see if I get something of a like manner, blah, blah, blah. You see the kind of listeners I have, why I love the show. I, I tell you the truth, it's my lifeline to my own sanity. I don't have people that I can really talk to other than outside of a, you know, one or two in my life. I'm a loner at the end of the day. As well as I can communicate, and believe me, I'm a, per a people person. I like people. At least I did when I was a boy. Maybe I'm imagining I like people. But if you put me in a social group, I'm actually quite sociable. I enjoy people. I get along with people and, and such. But I don't have a lot of people around me. But I have a lot of listeners. And amongst the listeners, there are people like this who really appreciate what I'm doing, what I'm trying to do, and how I do it, and what form it takes. That's all I want to say. That's all I'm saying. So to me, radio is my lifeline. You, my audience, are my life rafts.
and I know it's the same for you. You not only hear me, but you hear others call and make you feel sane in an insane world, right? And you no longer feel isolated the way Obama wants you to feel like you're the wrong one. You're not. You're actually the majority of this country. I'll be right back. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. My Savage Nation is sponsored by SwissAmerica.com. It's the only company I trust to protect my wealth. Call 800-B-U-Y-C-O-I-N. Climate change is real. And it also happens to be the greatest business opportunity to come to our country for a hundred years. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Nancy so Pelosi knows we that. we must create an American right. job. Knock off O'Malley. Please turn it off. Climate change is real, and it happens to be the greatest business opportunity. Well, he's telling you the truth about it being a business opportunity for him and his cronies. Many people have made fortunes on uh, climate change without proving that it's real. And more particularly without, without proving that man is causing the climate change. Now, I'm all for pure air and clean waters and stuff. And I've worked at that for many years, decades, as a matter of fact. But there is no consensus that man is causing climate change. None whatsoever. And also, those of you who are self-righteously driving battery-driven cars, I applaud your desire to drive a clean car. Uh, but behind that clean car, there's some really filthy energy that was used to make that battery that probably you don't know about. Or every time you recharge that clean little battery, where do you think the energy is coming from at the recharging station? Probably a coal-fired plant somewhere or a water-generated uh, plant somewhere, but I guess that's causing you to think too much as you drive around in your, in your, in your snotty little car. But we're talking about with socialism. It's uh, going through a revival right now. It's a kind of knee-jerk response to to things for the college educated people who live at home and their mothers and can't get jobs and are on medication they don't understand why no one will hire them they're unemployable that's why they're unemployable is because they were steeped in anti-american socialism and there's no jobs for them i mean how many government jobs can there be another 75 million government jobs i guess that would take care of their employment needs jerry brown is moving as quickly as he can to create as many state jobs as he can for people to do nothing but stop those of us who do something from doing more for society but why is socialism going through this popularity well let's look at the other side of the ledger on the other side of the ledger we see men like bill gates in microsoft not paying his fair share of taxes in my opinion on the other side of the ledger we see men like warren buffet not at all paying his fair share of taxes while telling you to pay your fair share of taxes now, Warren Buffet has always said we're not paying enough taxes, while he himself derives dividend income and pays 15% on it. You probably pay 39% in federal tax on your income. Warren Buffet, a good friend of Obama, is also in favor of blocking the Keystone XL pipeline, which is why his stooge in the White House, the golfer, has continuously blocked the Keystone XL pipeline. The reason the stooge in the White House has blocked the Keystone XL pipeline is because Guys like Warren Buffet uh, transport the oil, the raw oil from the Alberta tar sands to our refineries on his railroad cars. And to transport the oil for refining to our refineries by pipeline would be much cheaper than by Warren Buffet's railroad cars. And it would put his uh, enterprise, his railroad enterprise, in jeopardy. As a result, he's against the XL pipeline, and so the stooge in the White House vetoed the Keystone XL pipeline, even though the unions wanted the Keystone XL pipeline because it would have created many, many jobs for union members. So you look at the other side of the ledger and you see these greedy pigs disguised as very nice men getting away with virtual murder, not paying their fair share. You look at corporate structures and most people who work for corporations are you and I. They're your neighbor. They're you. And you're paying your fair share of taxes. You have to. It's taken out of your paycheck. And yet there are people who are living at the corporate level who are not paying their fair share of taxes, getting around the tax law. Look at what came out about Google in Europe. Google paid something like a few hundred million dollars on many, many billions of dollars of income because of the tricks they're using in their tax structures in Europe. Well, I hope to God the European Union takes them to the cleaners and takes from the Google boys what they deserve, which is a fair taxation. 
So yes, there are problems with the some of the very, very powerful, and mainly those connected to the political structure, getting away with paying very little in taxes, and we see it. So that fuels this desire for equality, this desire to get even. But you better be very careful what you wish for, as they say, because socialism has never worked anywhere on Earth. Nowhere on Earth has it ever worked. Savage.